Well, hi folks, how you doing today? Today is Thursday, Holy Thursday, the day the Lord celebrated the Last Supper, the Passover meal, and as we know, the Last Supper, and it's called Monday Thursday, Holy Thursday. Um, anyway, Karen and I watched the 700 Club this morning. Believe it or not, they took communion. So I thought that was interesting. Once a year, Pat Robertson has communion. I don't know why not more often than that, because he recited, whenever you do this, as we all know. He also had, yesterday, he had Max Lucado on. He talked about, as you know, the coronavirus and that we need to be, are you, are you um, strengthening your faith or are you living in fear? What are you doing at this time? Because as we know, we should be using this time to strengthen our faith. We live in America. We believe in God. We believe God watches over this nation. And we believe he will take care of us. Of course, we have to take our own preventive measures, but he will take care of us. What I'm about to record and show you is, it's um, from the Mass yesterday. I know everybody freaks out if they see a Catholic priest. This is really good. This is a take, uh, something I didn't realize, on the betrayal of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, among some other things. You'll believe it if you watch all the way to the end of his sermon. He has an altar call. Quite interesting. I bet you didn't know Catholic priests did that. We are all one faith. He says it here too. So... May the Lord bless you and keep you, especially during this Easter week, this Holy Week. And we lift everything up to him because it is his. Thank you, folks. Do you have a, fra a favorite Christian hymn that you like to sing, one that especially expresses your own interior sentiments of love for the Lord. I was thinking this morning about my own you know, connection with music and playing the organ in our little parish in Worthington, Iowa, and, and the hymns that I especially like to play. I thought of my more recent times in religious life and ordained to the priesthood and the different hymns that I especially loved at those times, and, and even those that I will sing sometimes just on my own to the Lord today. And sometimes these hymns change during our lives because we have different sentiments or we find something that more expresses what's going on interiorly. Or perhaps it's something that just really is poignant in expressing our faith. And you know, this morning, we already sang perhaps the most ancient Christian hymn that exists. Philippians chapter two. And the catechism number 461 is the first article regarding the incarnation, God becoming man and dwelling among us. The very first article says that St. Paul cites, cites a hymn in Philippians chapter two. And we see in this, this ancient hymn, this very early hymn in the Christian faith, that there are these short rhythmic lines. So it really points to it being this hymn that the early Christians sang as a way to express their faith. And really our, our Christian hymns are those that they clearly bring home the doctrine, the truths of our faith, but they do it in a poetic way that just stirs the heart and musically as well. And so we heard this morning a portion of Philippians chapter two that speaks of our Lord's passion. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bend. That's why the liturgy, we are instructed at the name of Jesus, the priest bows his head. In the name of Jesus, every knee should bend of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, for the Lord became obedient to death, 
death on a cross. Therefore, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So it was a way in which the faith was communicated, the clear truth of the incarnation of our Lord's suffering and his death, but then also that he is the Lord forever to the glory of God the Father because he is risen from the dead. Today we're also going to be hearing a couple of other uh, hymns from our ancient past. One of those that we're most familiar with, I think, especially when we pray the Stations of the Cross, is the Stabat Mater. And there's something about that hymn, and that's about 800 years old, 750, 800 years old. Think of all the saints of those centuries that would have sung the Stabat Mater, these verses that speak of at the cross, her station keeping, stood the mournful mother weeping, close to Jesus to the last. It just puts you right there with Mary, who stays with Jesus close to the last. Another hymn is one that expresses the passion of our Lord, Ah, Holy Jesus. And this is based on 11th century meditation. Ah, Holy Jesus. Listen to some of these beautiful verses that are expressed in this meditation. Again, about a thousand years old. And you think too of saints who would have prayed these words, who would have sung these words. Lo, the good shepherd for the sheep is offered. The slave has sinned and the son has suffered. For man's atonement, while he nothing heeded, God interceded. For me, kind Jesus, was thine incarnation, thy mortal sorrow, and thy life's oblation, thy death of anguish and thy bitter passion for my salvation. And the last verse, therefore, kind Jesus, since I cannot pay thee, I do adore thee and will ever pray thee. Think on thy pity and thy love unswerving. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? Thy love unswerving. His love would not be deterred. Not my deserving. I don't deserve that kind of love. And yet your love, Lord, was unswerving to the end, your love for me. We have during this Holy Week the servant songs. They are called of Isaiah. And on Good Friday, we're going to hear the most poignant of them, chapter 52 and 53, that speaks so accurately of the sufferings that the servant of God would endure. And the servant of God that's described in these different servant songs in the prophet Isaiah, that we can see some of them as embodying the people of Israel. And we heard that on, I believe, uh, yesterday. Yesterday, so, you are my servant, he said to me, Israel through whom I show my glory. But then we also see that as personified as in one person in particular. Why? Because he's going to be an instrument for the salvation of Israel and all the nations. You formed me as his servant from the womb, that Jacob may be brought back to him and Israel gathered to him. He's going to be an instrument, this person, of bringing Israel back to the Lord to raise up the tribes of Jacob, restore the survivors of Israel. I'll make you a light to the nations. And then today we had another servant song from chapter 50, which speaks of the sufferings that this servant would endure. And yet he's going to be undeterred, unswerving again in his love. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who plucked my beard. My face I did not shield from buffets and spitting. And how is it that he's able to endure all of this? Twice 
This passage says, the Lord God is my help. The Lord God is my help. He is near who upholds my rights. That's why Jesus, that he will prevail ultimately over his persecutors because God stands near to him to vindicate him. You know, there's a unique feature on the face of the Shroud of Turin that you think of all of the tortures that our Lord endured. And yet what we see in this beautiful face on the Shroud of Turin, the reputed beauty burial cloth of Christ, is that this face has peace and strength. It's not an anguished faith, face of despair, but it is this calm, peaceful strength. That's what we see depicted in this reputed burial cloth of Christ, of the Shroud of Turin, that his love is unswerving. He's going to accomplish the Father's will. He's going to be obedient even unto death, as that early Christian hymn put it, that St. Paul quotes in Philippians chapter 2. He's going to be unswerving obedient even to death, and because of this, he's going to be highly exalted so that everyone will say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, did you pick up in the Gospels, the first time that I came across this uh, in a commentary that I read in the Gospel, how Jesus had three times before this in Matthew's Gospel, and today we had Matthew 26, three times before, he speaks about he's going to be turned over to the authorities. He's going to be put to death. So he's talked about this three on three occasions. Now here in this very intimate setting of the Passover meal at evening, he says something that shocks the apostles. One of you will betray me. And they're shocked. Surely it is not I, Lord. We're all capable of this, right? And yet they can't see that, that they would ever betray this one that they've come to call Lord, whom they love so much themselves, who they are following. They've left things behind to follow him. Surely it's not I, Lord. Only one of the apostles answers differently. And perhaps he answers only because he doesn't want to appear conspicuous in his betrayal. Surely it is not I, Rabbi. You are a teacher. You're not my Lord. Surely it is not I, Rabbi. And Jesus answers in a Jewish way in which he is saying what you said is accurate, is true. You have said so. We think about Judas and the sad story of Judas that he is this follower of Jesus, one of his intimate friends. And perhaps it was that he liked the miracles, the multiplication of the loaves and fish of being sent out to heal and to deliver these things that reveal divine power. But then there were other things that apparently he did not uh, want to buy into. Take up your cross, love your enemies, pray for your persecutors. And one of the things that really seems to have been a stumbling block to Judas was Jesus' teaching in the Eucharist. If you read John chapter 6, at the end of that, when the Lord said, it's necessary for you to eat my flesh and my blood. The Lord says, when many others had left him, I said to the apostles, are you going to leave me too? And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of everlasting life. We've come to know and believe you are the Son of God, the Christ. And what does Jesus say after that? Did I not choose the 12 of you and one of you as a devil? And John says he was speaking about Judas. So this seems to be especially one thing that just was too much. 
for him to accept. And eventually this interior infidelity, this interior rejection led to this evil action of actually betraying the Lord. Surely it's not I, Rabbi. You're a renowned teacher. You're not my Lord. So it is for us to say those words of that early Christian hymn that we began with the entrance antiphon today. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bend. Of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. For the Lord became obedient to death, death on a cross. Therefore, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, a friend of ours reminded me the other day, he was thankful for how we're encouraging people, especially during this time, to know that we're praying for you. As I've said before, we're praying with you. We have these different devotionals. We'll have one today at 3 p.m. Eastern time. We're gonna have a holy hour with a rosary and the Divine Mercy Chaplet that's going to be sung. The Divine Mercy Chaplet, we think of especially calling upon the passion of Christ for the Father, to look at the passion of Christ and to have mercy on us. We'll be praying as well the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary during this Holy Week. So we're here for you, we're praying with you and for you, and we ask you to join us in prayer this afternoon at 2 p.m. <clears throat> but this friend was pointing out, he said, you know, Father Joseph, he said, it's not only Catholics that are watching, but we who are not Catholics, we're watching, we're listening to, we're encouraged. And we are in this common faith in Jesus, who is the Lord, whom we pro pro proclaim as Lord, not just a teacher, not just a rabbi, but my Lord, for before whom I bow whom I love because you love me with a love unswerving and you continue to do so. But it also was brought home to me as well that I know that there are also those who are not Christians who are watching. Yesterday, someone called into our viewer services who was not a Christian, who was moved by something that Father John Paul said. I want to welcome all of you. Those of you who are not Catholic, those of you who are not Christian, and I want to tell you who do not yet know Jesus Christ, that he truly is the Lord. And the thing that points to the, the truth of that fact that the early Christians 2000 years ago sang about, the thing that points to that truth is that he rose again from the dead. And there's so much evidence that we could go into that supports that but our own faith as well. And I would ask you who do not yet know Jesus Christ to ask him to reveal himself to you, who is the risen Lord, whom we go with during this holy week, remembering he had this love unswerving, that he loved us until the end. But then he went to that as the servant song today said, knowing that the Lord God is my help, that he is near to me, that he would rise again from the dead. Yes, he would be betrayed by one of his closest followers. But then those who, yes, who had fled, but then they returned back to the Lord, proclaimed that truth, even to their own deaths, because they knew that he was the Lord of life. And that physical death ultimately was not the end of his story, and it wasn't going to be the end of their stories, who knew him, who believed in him, who loved him. So those of you who do not yet know Christ, invite him into your life. The risen Lord, reveal yourself to them and ask the Lord to do that so that you might come to know him. And we who are Christians, let us rejoice in the faith that we have that gives us hope even in this dark time in this anxious time, that Christians still have hope and joy even, because we know ultimately that even if this virus would take our lives, that's not the end of our story. 
the end of our story is glory because Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Entrusting ourselves to the mercy of God, which will never fail us, we offer to God our needs in this time of crisis. For those who are experiencing anxiety, fear, loneliness, and depression during these days, that during this televised Mass, they may experience the presence of Jesus to comfort them and to give them renewed hope, we pray to the Lord. Lord, be our prayer. For those who have lost jobs and are worried about meeting their needs in the future, that they may experience God's loving providence today and in the days to come, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. For the health care professionals and our leaders who are overworked and exhausted, that the Lord give them renewed strength, protection from the coronavirus, and angelic assistance, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For enlightenment for our scientists, protection for the uninfected, healing for those presently suffering from the coronavirus, and eternal rest to those who have died, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our we pray for those who do not yet know Jesus Christ, that through this Holy Mass being offered this morning, and through the media transmitted throughout the world, they may come to encounter Jesus Christ and call him Lord. We pray to the Lord. 